Test. Test, test.
Now, uh, God bless you. We're so glad you're here tonight, and we welcome everyone online through Facebook. Um, if you have your Bibles tonight, I want to open with a scripture in Proverbs 22. And so if you'll turn to that, I'm going to pray, and we'll begin our lesson. Father, we just want to thank you tonight that the Word of God is living, active, powerful, sharp. We ask that you'd send your word into each one of our hearts tonight, God, that we just wouldn't be hearers of the word, but we would be doers of the word so that we don't deceive our own hearts. And Lord, we ask tonight that you would just do a great work through the word and through the spirit of God, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the title of the lesson tonight is Anger Management. <laughs> so aren't you glad you came? Uh, and so I'm in Proverbs 22. And I want to read verse 24. It says this, Make no friendship with an angry man. With a furious man you shall not go. And I want to read verse 25. Lest you learn his ways and get a snare to your own soul. So in essence, the Bible is saying that we don't want to have close friendships with angry people. And so in verse 24, you know me by now, I'm going to break down a few definitions. In verse 24, it says, make no friendship with an angry man. The word for anger in Proverbs 22, 24 is rapid breathing. And I don't know if any of you have ever gotten angry. And if you haven't, you're a liar. <laughs> and so we'll pray later about that. But don't you notice when you get angry that your breathing picks up? And so the word anger is like just furious breathing. So it says, make no friendship with an angry man, rapid breathing. Or with a furious man. And I thought, well, what's the difference between an angry man and a furious man? The word furious in this verse means to have heated poison. So anger is a dangerous thing. It can actually make us sick in every area of our life. And if you look at verse 25, 24 says, Make no friendship with an angry man, lest you learn his ways. Now listen to the next verse. And snare your own soul. And so tonight I want to take a look at several people in the Bible and show you different ways that anger expresses itself. And so again, it says, don't make friendship with an angry person, lest you snare your own soul. And um, so the first story we're going to look at tonight is in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 13. 2 Samuel, chapter 13. I have, let me see, one, two, three, I have four examples that I want to make out of the Bible tonight and uh, you can see if you identify with this or you can blame it on your mother. Um, second Samuel, I can't find Second Samuel. All right, hold on now. Come on. Where's Second Samuel? Here we go. Finally. I found first so I know I'm in the ballpark. Here's what happens in Second Samuel 13. So let me tell you the story before we read the verses and take a look exactly at this anger. David had, he had many, many sons and daughters, as you know, but there are three that are the characters of this chapter in 2 Samuel 13. He has a son named Absalom, and a sister named Tamar, and another brother named Ammon. Now, what's important for the story is that Absalom and Tamar were whole brother and sister. They had the same father and the same mother. Ammon was a half-brother. He had David as a father, but a different mother. And so in this chapter, we're not going to read it for time's sake, but I'll tell you what happened. Ammon decided that he was in love with or lusting after his half-sister Tamar. And uh, he couldn't find a way to take advantage of her because people were always around. So he decided to act like he was sick. And so he tells his servants, I'm really sick, and the only thing that's going to help me is if my sister Tamar makes me some chicken broth with dumplings. And so David gets word that um, his son is sick, Ammon, and David sends word to Tamar, his daughter, and says, listen, your brother's ill. Take him some homemade soup or whatever till he feels better. So here's Tamar, as innocent as can be. She goes over to her brother Ammon's house with whatever food she was bringing to make him feel better, and he puts everybody out. And after everybody is out of the house, he takes advantage of his sister. I mean, it's in the Bible. You can read it. But he actually rapes her. And the Bible said, and before he took advantage of her, he loved her. After he raped her, the Bible said he, he hated her with a greater hatred than he loved her. And he puts her out of the house, and he bolts the door. Now, here's Tamar. She's devastated. If you've ever read the story, being a virgin, uh, the daughter of a king, she wore a robe of many colors like Joseph. 
And so she tore her coat of many colors. She put dirt and ashes on her head. And she walked up and down the streets, des des just devastated. And she's got her hand over her head, ashes on her head. Her garments are ripped. And who does she run into but her brother, Absalom. And her brother, Absalom, says to him, has Ammon, my brother, done this to you? And she said, yes. And so she is going to be now, I'm going to read, even though you don't have it on your paper, I want to read um, starting at verse 18 of 2 Samuel 13. And I want to show you how angry Absalom gets, how angry King David gets, and what happens in the story. So we are in 2 Samuel 13, verse 18. Now this is Tamar. She had a garment of diverse colors upon her. For such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparel. Then the servant bolded, uh, then his servant, this is um, Ammon's servant, then his servant brought her out and bolded the door behind her. And Tamar put ashes on her head, rent her garment of divers colors, laid her hand on her head, and went out crying. Now she brumps into her whole brother Absalom, verse 20. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Ammon thy brother been with thee? But now hold your peace, my sister, for he is your brother. Regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. She couldn't marry now. She was what they would call defiled or spoiled. And being uh, the king's daughter, she could not marry anyone now because of what her brother had done to her. Verse 21. Now look at this verse. I want to read to 23, verse 21. But when King David heard of all these things, he was wrought. I can't imagine as a parent ever hearing that my son would be inappropriate with my daughter. You can't just read this like some story in the days gone by. This is real life. And I've actually been in pastor's homes that have trusted me enough to talk to me in confidence. I know one particular pastor. You don't know him. He's way upstate in Pennsylvania. But his daughter was raped by her brother and she was pregnant. And they had this terrible dilemma of what to do. I think they ended up giving the baby up for adoption. But I didn't know that this would happen in a pastor's home. You know, maybe this was five years ago. And so it's not just a story in the Bible. This is happening every day, as long as the evil one is in control and the wickedness is out there. So in verse 21, David gets really angry because he finds out his son took advantage of his daughter. But things go much worse from there. In verse 21, the word uh, wroth, King David got wroth. It means to blaze in anger, to actually produce heat. He's so angry now that he's producing heat. And if you've ever seen somebody get really furious, most times they get red in the face. Um, the blood pressure shoots way through the roof, and you can actually physically see a person who's overtaken with anger. So he's blazing in heat. Now, the sad thing is, and I don't have time because of the whole lesson tonight, David really doesn't do anything about this, which is pretty sad for the children. Verse 22. And Absalom now did not speak to Ammon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Ammon because he had forced his sister. Just the beginning of verse 23. And it came to pass after two full years. Now, here's what I want you to know. One symptom of an angry man, someone that doesn't know how to process their anger and take care of their anger, they just give you the silent treatment. They get mad at you and they just stop speaking to you. Um, this was my MO. Oh, please, just make me mad. Um, I didn't talk to my own brother for years. We lived in the same house. And I was so angry with my brother that my mother tells me I went four years, four years without speaking to my own brother who I lived with in my house. And um, so I know what it is to give somebody the silent treatment. Uh, ask my husband. <clears throat> but anyway, this is one MO of an angry person because they don't know what to do with their anger. They just stop talking to the person they're mad at or they just give them a one-word answer. How are you? Fine. Everything okay? Great. Never been better. You know what I'm talking about. So he doesn't speak to his brother. Uh, for two full years. Then what happens in the story, just so everybody's on the same page, what happens in the story is Absalom is so angry that Ammon did this that he wants to take vengeance for his sister Tamar. So he pretends to have a party and invites all the king's sons. Now there's no party, no one's invited but Ammon, but it's a setup, okay? You can read the chapter at home. So Ammon comes thinking he's going to a party with all his brothers and sisters, and there's nobody there but Absalom, and Absalom kills Ammon. And then he has to flee the country. And so he leaves the, his homeland, and he's gone for three years, 
He comes back. Turn over with me to 2 Samuel 14. He's gone for three years, which is, if you're interested, it's in 2 Samuel 13, 39. No, 38. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur, and he stayed there for three years. Now, remember, David's mad about what happened, but he doesn't do anything. Absalom kills Ammon and flees, and he's gone for three years. Finally, they talk David into letting his son come home. He doesn't even want him to come home. Because how many of you know, when you're really mad at someone, you don't want to be in their presence. You know, I'm so glad they live where they live. So Joab finally talks David into letting Absalom come home. Absalom comes home, and I want you to look over at verse 28 of 2 Samuel 14. It says, so Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, and he did not see the king's face. So what this shows me, anger separates families. It separates brothers. It separates fathers and sons. It had been five years since this incident happened. David didn't do anything with his anger except get mad about it. And Absalom ended up five years, and then finally he got to see the king. And then if you know the story, he tried to overthrow the king because Absalom was so mad at his father for not... He, I, I've got to stay on track, but Absalom actually thought he did a good thing by, you know, delivering his sister and that David would say, listen, Absalom, thank you. You know, Ammon deserved death for what he did, but David didn't react like that. And so that's one symptom of an angry man. Remember, my topic tonight uh, is don't make friends with an angry person lest you learn their ways. Well, this is one way angry people react. They shut you out. They stop talking to you, and they want you to keep a distance from them. Let's take a look at our second story. I call this a huff and puff, and this one is found in 1 Kings 21. So you're just going to head to the right, 1 Kings chapter 21, and I want to read um, verses 1 to 4. Now, the first thing we learned about some ways of an angry man is the cold shoulder, the silent treatment. This one is really so pitiful. You're going to see this king sulk and pout, put his bottom lip out. He's all in a, in a tither. Here we go. 1 Kings 21, 1 to 4. It came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. And Ahab spake to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I might have it for a garden of herbs, because it's near to my house, and I will give you for it a better vineyard, or if it seems good to you, I'll give it to you in the worth of money. So what happens is that Ahab is the king, and he's got a palace, and right next to the palace, there's a man who owns land named Nabob, and the king Ahab goes and says, listen, sell me your property. I want to plant an herb garden, and I want it convenient and close to my house. So that's what we've read in verse 1 and 2. Then in verse 3, it says, And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my father to you. Now understand, in the Bible days, we didn't have, um, like, I'm going to leave you bonds and stocks, and I have a safety deposit box at PNC. In the Bible, their land was the most important thing they had. It went from generation to generation. So Naboth, very respectfully, said to King Ahab, I can't give you this property. It's been in my family for centuries. I'm going to give it to my sons, and they're going to give it to their sons' sons. I can't sell it to you, and I can't give it to you. Well, Ahab gets furious. He gets so angry. Look at verse 4, and then I'll break down some words for you. So Ahab came to his house heavy and displeased. I'll go back to that in a minute. Because of the word that Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. So he lay down upon his bed, poor baby, turned his face to the wall and would eat no bread. Ain't that a shame? Here's a grown man sulking like a baby. And you all look innocent, but you've all done it. There's not one of us that hasn't done this. And so he goes home and lays on his bed, poor thing, and he doesn't want to eat. He doesn't want to talk. He's just, so I have to give you some definitions because this verse is very funny to me. In verse four, when it said Ahab came to his house heavy, the word for heavy in the King James means stubborn. And most times when we get angry, we get really stubborn. And it says this thing displeased him. Now this is, I love this. I have this highlighted in every Bible I own. It means to run out of humor. How many of you know that when you're angry at somebody, nothing is funny? 
I don't know what that is, Bill. Can you work on that? Feedback, Bill? Are you with me? Does everybody else hear that beside me? I'll just keep preaching. But there's something going on in the background, but I'm not going to let it bother me, so stay with me. Okay, so in verse 4, it said, Ahab came to his house heavy, stubborn, and displeased to run out of humor. One version actually said he sulked because he didn't get what he wanted. So be careful, and the answer is obviously he pouted or sulked uh, because he didn't get what he wanted. And lots of times we don't get what we want, but we still have to, we can't let it make us angry. And uh, so that's our second story. So here's the king of Israel acting like a baby, laying in the bed he won't eat. And if you know the story, I'll just tell a minute of it. His wife comes in and says, what are you doing? You're the king of Israel. Get the heck up. She said, you better eat. And so, of course, being submissive to Jezebel, he, he gets up and he eats. And she said, I'll take care of it. She goes out and she lies about Nabal. She sends a letter in the king's name, which he never sent. And they kill poor Nabal who hasn't done anything but defend his property. So when he got mad, instead of the silent treatment, he sulked. He didn't want to eat. He didn't want to, he had no humor. He was stubborn. Let's take a look at our third story. This one I call, I'm out of here. Second Kings chapter five. And I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture, but we have the time. Because, you know, not everybody is familiar with all the stories of the Bible. And for some reason, um, my gifting is the Old Testament. I'm going to try in this class coming to teach something out of the New Testament. But I absolutely love the Old Testament with a passion. And I don't assume everybody knows these stories of Ammon and Absalom and Tamar and, and Nabal and, and uh, Jezebel. And so that's why we're going to read through this story tonight. And so we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to read 1 through 12. And remember tonight, our goal is to learn the way of an angry man so we don't snare our soul with the silent treatment, with the sulking and the pouting. And then this one, he leaves in a rage. Um, 2 Kings 5.1. Now Naaman was the captain of the host of the king of Syria. He was a great man with his master. He was honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out in companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife, this little Hebrew girl that was brought over to be a servant to Na uh, Naaman's wife. Okay, verse 3. And she said to her mistress, I would God, my Lord, that there were a prophet in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, verse 4, Thus and thus, thus and thus, saith the maid that's in the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go, I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed. He took 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, 10 changes of raiment. Whoo, cha-ching, cha-ching. Verse 6. And he brought a letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come to thee, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to thee, that you would recover him of his leprosy. Now this floors the king because he's not a healer, he's a king. Verse 7. And it came to pass that when the king of Israel read the letter, he rent or tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill or make alive that this man does send me to recover him of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray thee, and see now, do you have a quarrel against me? Verse 8, Now enter the prophet Elisha. And it was so that when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he sent word to the king, saying, Wherefore have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. I want you to get a mental picture of that. I'm talking Ben-Hur here. I'm talking white stallions with red plumage and just a whole fanfare. This guy's a captain of the army and defeated the enemy. And he comes in big pomp and he pulls up with all his stallions and horses and chariots. And now he's going to get really mad. Verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger saying, go wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will come clean to you and you will be clean. But Naaman was wrought. And he went away and said, Behold, I thought he'd surely come out to me. Stand and call in the name of the Lord as God strike his hand over the place and recover the leprosy. Can I just pause a minute and say to you, don't we all want the easy way out? Naaman doesn't want to do anything. He wants the prophet to come out, wave his hand over and say, Be healed. And he's healed. 
Well, that's not the plan here. The plan is, will you obey God even when it seems silly or unreasonable? So Naaman, this captain, this man of war, is furious. Verse 12, he said, Are not Abana and far, far rivers of Damascus better than the water of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned, don't miss this, and he went away in a rage. That was it. Some people can't handle their anger. They don't know how to sulk or be stubborn or they don't know how to give you the sign treatment. So they leave. They just take off and slam the door. I remember one time I was having a little tip with my husband. I can't even imagine what it was about, but I'm sure he was the, at fault. And um, so I got really mad at my husband. And I'm not given to anger. I have other issues, but anger is not pretty much not my M.O., but I was really, really angry, and he goes, what's for dinner? And so I opened the freezer, I'll never forget this, and I took a frozen chicken, threw it in the sink, and said, there's your dinner. Out the door I went, got in my car, and sped off. Well, let me tell you, when I got home, I realized that the frozen chicken had taken a chunk out of my sink, and so for the next 10 years, every time I did the dishes, there it was. There it was with the rotten attitude, the anger, throwing a frozen chicken. Listen, he's like I didn't throw it at him. At least I threw it in the sink. I mean, people have done some crazy things when they're overcome with anger. So what is this MO? This is not the silent treatment. This is not sulking and pouting. This is I'm out of here and they leave and I don't know. Uh, that's, that's some people when they get angry, they just have to get out. They have to go. And um, so that's he left in a rage, which just means he he was furious. The last one we're going to look at before we get to some solutions, because <laughs> I'm not real thrilled that we have to deal with anger tonight, but if you want a victorious life, I'm telling you the truth, you've got to be quick to deal with your anger. And you'll have lots of opportunities to do every one of these MOs. You just stop talking to the person you're mad at. You uh, sulk and don't want to eat and don't want to go anywhere. Um, and then you leave in a rage. Very dangerous. Uh, our next story is uh, in the New Testament, yay! Acts chapter eight. Now I wanna just spend a little bit of time, I have time, I wanna spend a little bit of time on the Apostle Paul. Uh, before His name was Saul before his name was changed to Paul. And so we're gonna take a look <clears throat> at him. He was absolutely filled with anger. I call him the maniac because there's a verse that actually said he acted like a maniac. And he needed, uh, he didn't need AA for alcohol. He needed anger, whatever you can put with an A, anger arrest or something. He was off the deep end, this guy. Now remember, before we look at this, he was a Sadducee of Sadducees or a Pharisee. He had credentials. He, he knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand. I don't know right now, I can't remember if it's the Pharisees or the Sadducees. I think the Pharisees had to memorize, listen to me, the Torah. That is the first five books of the Bible, not the first five chapters of Genesis. They memorized all of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I can't even begin to process any such, it would take me my whole life to get a chapter memorized. And so when it came to Saul, he had great passion for the Lord. And when Jesus and his disciples came on the scene, Paul, who was Saul, I got to call him by his right name, Saul thought that this movement of Christianity was taking Jews from Judaism. So he wanted to defend the Old Testament. He thought that Christ was a false god, and they were taking the Jews from the homeland and from their faith, and so he was going to stop this at any cost, and he really had an issue with his anger. So we're going to read Acts 8, 1 to 3. It says, and Saul was consenting to his death. This is when Stephen was martyred. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, they had just stoned Stephen to death. Verse 2, devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and they made great lamentation over him. Now, verse 3, I'm going to go real slow with this verse. I kind of wish I had written it in the Amplified Version for you. But it says, And Saul made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hauling men and women, committing them to prison. So let me give you a couple definitions and just tell you that he made havoc 
of the church. The NIV said he tried to destroy the church, and one version said he was uh, raging against the church. So before I give you the definition of havoc, for Saul made havoc, just picture with me, you're sitting on the couch, it's, I don't know, Monday night or Tuesday night or whenever, I'll just pick Dancing with the Stars, I can't think of a show. You're sitting watching Dancing with the Stars, and all of a sudden, somebody's got a battering ram, they batter in your front door, they grab you by the nape of the neck, and they drag you out in the driveway, and they start kicking you and beating you, and then they're waiting is a, a, a paddy wagon to take you to prison. That's what I just read. He is out of control with his anger. And so it said he made havoc. The word havoc in the original language in verse 3 means to disgrace a person by continual insults. So I don't have any idea what he was saying, but how many of you know when people get angry, they say things they wish they never said? We've all done it. It starts to spew, and the next thing you know, there's this volcano, volcano of angry words coming out to disgrace someone by insulting them. So it said Saul made havoc, and again, I've already told you um, in the NIV, it said he destroyed the church, uh, entering into every house, not just one home, not just one prayer meeting. He went into every single person's house that he found was a believer. And when he went in, he hauled them, men and women, committing them to prison. Now, again, I don't know what version of the Bible you're using. I'm still in the King James. But when I look up the word hauling them to prison, it means to drag them forcibly. So he's actually hands-on. He's so angry, he's dragging them out of the house to put him in prison. And so this is certainly the way of an angry man, okay? Uh, I call him a maniac because he made havoc. Now, he gets saved in Acts 9. He gets knocked to the ground. He encounters Christ. Lord, what would you have me do? And so years later, after he's saved and becomes, his name is changed from Saul to Paul. I don't know if you know the difference. The name Saul means I've asked of God. But the name Paul means to be little, to be small in your own eyes. And if you know his life, you know that before his conversion, he was filled with pride. I'm a Jew of Jews. I was born this. I'm the tribe of Hebrew, Benjamin, I this, I that. Once he got saved, then the Lord leveled that out. And so he went from Saul to Paul, being small and little in your own eyes. Now, years go by, and he's going to be uh, arrested for something else and uh, for preaching the gospel. And he's going to go before the court. And I want to turn to Acts 26, and I want to read verse 11. And just show you how, how bad his anger was out of control. He was enraged, so that's the answer if you want to write it. Acts 26, 11, he was enraged. It, matter of fact, it means wild behavior. And I'm sorry to tell you I have a testimony. I wish I didn't, but I have time. Here we go. He says in verse 11, I punished them often in every synagogue. I compelled them to blaspheme. Now listen to this phrase. Being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even into strange cities. When you read the word in the King James where he was exceedingly mad, I want to give you the definition. To act like a maniac, to be enraged. So he is out of control. He's going into their houses, he's beating them, he's dragging them down the streets, he's following them from city to city. He's acting like a maniac. Now, I have enough time. I've got 10 full minutes, so I have enough time to share this and then give you some solutions. What do we do with our anger? In 2009, I, I would love to forget this event, but in 2009, my husband and I were going to go on vacation, and we were going to spend 14 days in Puerto Rico. Two weeks, we were going to stay in Puerto Rico. We have family there, and so our goal was to stay with them, and it would give us more money to do other things. And so I get to Puerto Rico, and nobody wants to do anything. Now, I'm going to try to condense this, but we just did nothing all day. For those that know me, I'm very hyper. I'm full of energy. I wake up like on the go as soon as my feet hit the floor, and I run like this till 11 o'clock at night. It's who I am. It's I believe it's the way God created me, or I need drugs. I'm not sure which one. But anyway, that's who I am. And so we did nothing. I mean nothing the whole day. Then the second day, the big event was to go to lunch. And so by the third day, I'm, I'm, I'm wired. I've got to get out of here. I've got to do something. I made several mistakes on that vacation. Number one, I didn't put my license in when we rented the car, so I couldn't drive. 
Now I'm stuck in this house for three days and I can't drive anywhere because my license wasn't on file. So I say to my brother-in-law, I'm going to go walk. He said, oh, you can't walk. We have wild dogs. Oh, you have wild dogs. Well, would you go with me with a big stick? And he said, no, I'm afraid of the dogs. I'm like, oh, great. Who let the dogs out? You know, who, who? So now I'm here and it's day four and day five. By day six, I'm ready to have a nervous breakdown. I can't take it. And uh, we, I'll tell you the outcome of this whole event. Now, by day nine, I had I had it. I couldn't I couldn't even process another day of doing nothing. I read like whole books of the Bible, like five, six books at a time. And uh, so I'm in the bedroom. My husband's sitting on the bed and I walked into the bedroom. And he said to me, Gwen, would you please calm down? And I flipped. I started screaming and raging and yell. I remember seeing my veins in my neck out here like pumping. Don't do tell me to calm down. I haven't done anything for day after day after day after day. I'm screaming. I'm spitting. I'm, I mean, I'm out of my mind. He's sitting on the bed. And my husband goes like this. Oh, dear Jesus, please help her. <laughs> so with that, I go out on the porch, the veranda. I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, walking back and forth. I can't take another day of this. <laughs> and my husband slides the cell phone out the door. He doesn't come out. He just slides the phone. He said, your son's on the phone. He called my son and said, listen, your mom is having a meltdown, an actual like emergency meltdown, like a white jacket zipper up. And Matt, you have to calm her down. So I get on the phone. I'm crying. I can't get control of myself. And Matt goes, my God, mom, what's the matter? So I start venting and telling him. He goes, mom, listen. He goes, I'm like you. He says, the second day, he said, I'd have been in the water swimming towards Miami. He, go, he goes, I think for your mental health, you should come home. So I go back in there and I have to apologize to my husband because I could have done him harm that day. I've never in my life, and I pray in Jesus' name, never again have I ever been that out of control. You know, you hear on the news about people that kill their partners or smash their head in with a lamp. I was that gone that if there had been a weapon there, I, I would have hurt him. I, I don't know what to blame this on other than the devil and, and my flesh, but it was very frightening to be that out of control. I mean, I actually blacked out. It was that bad. And so we came back in, and they gave me about an hour to calm down, and then we sat, the family sat down, and I was crying because everybody heard it. My God, you could have heard it in the cruise where the cruise ships come in. So, you know, over in San Juan. So I was crying, and I was apologizing to my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law, and my husband, and I said, listen, I can't stay. I have to go home tomorrow. And Boo said, yep, my husband's nickname is Boo. He goes, Gwen, we paid a lot of money for these tickets, and we're here another seven days. I said, no, I'm not. If you want to stay, sweetheart, fine, but I'm going home tomorrow. And I called the airlines, and it cost me $500 to come home early, and it was the best money I ever spent in my whole life. And my husband came home with me, so chalk up $1,000 because I got angry. Um, and so he will not take me back there. I've asked him, seriously, I've asked him every year, honey, could we go to Puerto Rico? He said, no, I'm afraid of you. I'm not taking you to Puerto Rico. And we talked it out when the event was over, and here's what we discovered. Some people's idea of a vacation is to relax. They just want to sit on the beach, you know, have a virgin pina colada, swim. My idea of a vacation is you get up at 7 in the morning and you run till 9 o'clock at night. You water ski, you jet ski, you, you go to Disney. You just nonstop. So we had never communicated what both of us wanted out of that vacation. And that was, that was a horror. It was not a vacation at all. So now I know that if my husband says he wants to go on vacation, then I know to make things that I can do if he wants to relax. And I was telling people, I was begging people in my sister-in-law's church, I'll pay your way. Just go out on a, on a catamaran with me. So we were going to go snorkeling. So I went to Walmart and I bought the fins and I bought the tube and I'm going to pay three girls away and not cheap by any means to go snorkeling with me. And they canceled the trip because it rained. So it was just one of those vacations. Are you with me? Um, so God bless Puerto Rico. Now let's look in our closing time in this lesson. What do we do when we get angry? And you, we all get angry. Don't even think you don't have an angry bone in your body. I've heard people say that. And I'm like, yeah. Proverbs 14, 29. Let's look at a solution. Here's the ways of anger. Silent treatment, huff and puff and sulk. Leave take off or act crazy. Um, Proverbs 14, and we're going to look at what to do about this. Now, Proverbs 14, 29 says this. 
Uh, he that is slow to wrath is of a great understanding. He that is hasty of spirit exalt, ex, um, exalts folly. In another version, it said, if you're quick-tempered, uh, it's very foolish. So here's what we have to do. We have to be patient. It said we should be slow to anger. And you've heard the counselors tell you, count to ten. I go, one, two, three, four, seven, and ten. I'm still mad. Still mad. But you need to take a breath, walk away, calm down. You know, we might even ask Jesus to help us. I mean, there's a novel idea. Like, Jesus, please help me. And my husband sat on that bed, eyes closed, head bowed, hands full. Jesus, help her. Jesus, help her. And he did. Um, we're married almost 53 years, so evidently we're doing something right. Okay. Slow down your anger. Okay. Number two, don't hold on to it. Let's look at Ephesians 4 for a minute. Uh, this is a excellent scripture. I know it by heart because I've needed it many times in my life. Ephesians 4, we're just going to look at verse 26, and then we're going to look at verse 32. Verse 26 said, Be ye angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Now what that verse means, and my answer is I don't want to hold on to it. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Um, but it actually says when you're angry, don't sin. Now, I don't have any notes with me or, or things I prepared, but there was times in the Bible that men righteously got angry and it wasn't sinful. Moses got angry when the people murmured against God and it wasn't a sin for Moses to be angry with them. We all know the story of Jesus in the temple when they were uh, selling and raising the money for sacrifices. He overturned the table and made a whip and drove them out. And so there is a time when you can have a righteous anger, an indignation that's not sinful. I'm angry that innocent babies are being abused. I'm very angry that we in America have abortion. I'm angry about that, and I'm not in sin. It's against the word of God. So be careful in your anger not to sin, all right? But the answer is for me to just slow it down, calm down. Let me read the verse again. In your anger, sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So do your best before the day's end to ask for forgiveness or forgive the person you're angry with. Um, I remember a time I was really mad at my husband. We're going to close this in a minute. But I was really mad at my husband, and I was tired of always apologizing. It was always I had to go and say I was sorry. I had to ask forgiveness. So this one time, who knows when, I said, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to ask him to forgive me. I'm waiting until he comes to me. And uh, so days went by, and I was miserable because I knew th the Lord was upset with me. I knew I was in sin by treating him roughly and not being kind. And, at, uh, and I said, I am not apologizing. You bring him to me. And finally, after about nine, ten days, I couldn't take it anymore. I thought, I'll go to him. So he was laying on the couch, and he had the TV controller. And I knelt down at his head, next to his head on the floor, and I said, Honey, I want to apologize because I'm not right with the Lord holding this anger against you. And he says to me, Oh, Jesus, thank you that you showed her the light. Now, how many of you know, I almost put his lights out. And then he busted out laughing, and he said, I'm sorry, too, and we made the amend. All right, so number one, slow, be slow to anger. The minute you start to feel it, deal with it. Number two, don't hold it for day after day after day. And then finally, uh, we'll close this session with 1 Timothy chapter 2, reading verse 8. It says this, 1 Timothy 2. I know what it says. I'm in the wrong book of Timothy. 1 Timothy 2, verse 8. I'm sure it says I would have men pray everywhere. Here we go. Uh, Gwen, come on. 1 Timothy 2. Verse 8, here it is. I would therefore that men pray everywhere. Now listen to this. Lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubt. So we are to pray with our hands lifted and without what? Anger. So when you're angry, number one, be slow to anger the best you can. Number two, don't feed it and hold on to it. And then number three, take it to God. Lift your hands and surrender and say, Lord, you know I'm angry and I know I'm going to sin in this and I'm sorry. Please help me. And he will give you the grace you need. So I'm going to close with prayer now. This was session one, anger management. We have our next lesson in a minute. Father, we just thank you tonight for the examples of these men. 
Lord, I just thought about there was no women here, but I know what the Bible said. Better to live in an empty attic than with an angry woman. <laughs> so, Lord, it applies to all of us, regardless of our gender. We just ask tonight, Lord, that you would help us not to sin when we get angry, not to be immature and stop speaking to people and pouting and leaving in a rage, slamming the doors and gunning the car. Father, we just ask you to help us to be slow to anger, to not give the devil any place, and so thank you for this lesson tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. I know you're online, just bear with me. Um, we're going to do another lesson in a minute, but I need a couple of minutes to give Bill time to switch over the uh, audio, and so I'm going to tell a couple of jokes just real quick, and um, then we'll go into our second lesson when he gives me the thumbs up. A couple were going out for the evening. They got ready, they got all dressed up, they set the lights, and they put the cat out. Their Uber driver arrived, and as the couple opened the front door, the cat zips back in between their legs and disappears up the steps. They don't want the cat shut in the house, so the wife goes out to the car while the husband goes upstairs to find the cat and put it out. The wife is so worried because there's been some recent break-ins in their neighborhood and not wanting anyone to know the house is empty, she explains to the Uber driver, he's just going upstairs to say goodnight to his mother. A few moments later, the husband gets into the cab very apologetically. Sorry I took so long, he says. The stupid old thing was hiding under the bed. I had to poke her with a coat hanger. I finally grabbed her by the scruff of her neck and I got her to come out. Then she slipped away and ran into the closet, but I quickly trapped her in the corner and got a good hold on her. <laughs> okay, another one. Uh, one night, uh, a daughter brought her boyfriend home to meet her parents. Upon first sight, the parents were astounded and appalled by this young man's appearance. He had a leather jacket on, motorcycle boots, tattoos, his nose was pierced, and they realized during dinner as he ate that his tongue had several piercings. At a discreet time, the parents pulled the daughter aside and said very diplomatically, Cindy, we're not really sure about him. He doesn't seem like a very nice person. Oh, mom, please, replies the blonde daughter. If he wasn't nice, would he be doing 500 hours of community service? <laughs> Do I need another one? Okay, I'm good. All right. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, we're going to start in the book of Proverbs. And the title of tonight's message is The High Price of Anger. And we're going to be in Proverbs for a moment, starting in uh, chapter 19, verse 19. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you tonight that the Bible said everything we need for life and godliness is given to us through the knowledge of the scriptures. Lord, would you open our hearts tonight and our minds to understand what anger cost us? That, Lord, we know in the book of Ephesians, it says, uh, in your anger, don't sin. And then the very next verse says, neither give the devil place. And so, God, we know tonight that when we have uncontrolled anger or outburst, it gives the enemy place. Lord, we want to be like Jesus. He was meek, and it was power under control. And so, Lord, tonight, would you open the scriptures to us, Lord? Help us to understand it and apply it, God. We're not here just for head knowledge. We're here to have our lives changed by the ever-increasing working of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. So we thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to start with Proverbs 19.19. 19. The title is The High Price of Anger. And uh, Proverbs 19.19 19 says this, A man of great wrath will suffer punishment. If you deliver him, yet you will have to do it again. And I wrote it in the NIV Bible. It said a hot-tempered person must pay a penalty. If you rescue him, you will have to do it again. Isn't that so true? If people are bent towards anger and you help them out of one situation, they get angry a couple days later and then they're in this. And so what it's saying is we will suffer if we don't deal with our anger. And I'm going to read it again. A man of great anger suffers punishment. If you deliver him once, you're going to have to continue to deliver him. So what happens if we don't resolve our anger is uh, we will suffer for it. And I'm sure many of you can testify, if you had the time, that you've paid the price of somebody else's anger. And it, it can make you suffer. Look at um, 
Proverbs 29, 22. We're right here. Look at, and I would encourage you guys uh, here and online, read a proverb of the day. There is nothing better to read than the Proverbs. Whatever date it is, read that proverb. Like today's the 8th of November, so I read Proverbs 8 this morning. Uh, it's filled with wisdom and knowledge. It'll really help you in your everyday life. So Proverbs 29, verse 22. I want to give you a little background before we look at some stories tonight of people in the, well, one particular person in the Old Testament that did not know how to control his anger, and it cost him dearly. So uh, Proverbs 29, 22. An angry man stirs up strife, and a furious man abounds in transgression. So what I get when I look at that verse, an angry person stirs up strife, a furious man ends up in, tra in um, trans uh, transgression. What it means is that if we don't deal with our anger, we're going to end up sinning. Eventually, you're going to sin. If not in action, you're going to sin in thought because you'd like to tell that person where to go, excuse me one minute, and exactly how to get there. <laughs> don't collect $200 and pass go. So uh, it, when you're angry, you really have to watch your, your language too. Um, so here's what I want. I want you to turn to Luke 9. This is very important that we see this. Luke 9. And there's a story of uh, Jesus. He was going into the town of Samaria. Now you know, or if you don't know, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. The Samaritans were a mixed group of people. They were originally Jews who married uh, pagans or Gentiles. Their children were now mixed, half-breeds or, or not whole, Jew. And so the Jews absolutely hated the Samaritans. I don't know if you're familiar, uh, before I read this, with the story of the woman at the well. But in John 4, there's a story of a Samaritan woman that went to the well at noontime. Very unusual because it's the hottest time of the day in Israel or the Middle East. It's about 110 degrees. All the women would go to the well first thing in the morning with their vessels and fill it with they ho what their household needed. This woman, because she'd been married several times, was an outcast. She went at noon. When she gets to the well in, uh, in John 4, Jesus is sitting at the well. And she asked him, do you have something to drink? And he tells her, you know the story, I have, I have to turn to John 4. Be flexible with me tonight. Just for a moment, let's turn to John 4 because there's a verse that I think it's important that we see. So John 4, and we'll come back to Luke in one minute. John, you know, when you pray for the Holy Spirit to lead you, then you can't stick to everything on the written paper because I want the Lord to have his way and to teach us and help us. And so it's important that you see this. And Holy Spirit, please Help me to find the verse. Um, so we're in John 4, and I'm looking for the verse in case anybody close to me can get it quicker than I can, where it said the Jews had no dealings. I found it, verse 9. So we're in John 4, and I'm going to pick it up maybe at verse 7, John 4, 7 through 9. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria to him, how is it, now watch this verse, how is it that you, being a Jew, would ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, please don't miss the end of this verse, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They absolutely hated them. They used to, if they had to go, let's, I'm just going to pick any city, I'm not right about this, but let's say they wanted to go to I'm just going to say they want to go to Jordan. And the direct way from where they are to Jordan is through the city of Samaria. They would go miles out of their way so they wouldn't have to go through the village of the Samaritans. So in John 4, 9, you see that there's some racial tension. There's some hatred here between Jews and Samaritans. Now go back to Luke, and it'll help you understand the story better, I hope. Luke 9, and I'm going to read starting at verse 51. And it came to pass that when the time had come that he, Jesus, should uh, be received up, he steadfast set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Verse 53. But they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, 
Will you that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? And Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went into another village. Now, I don't want you to miss this. It's very important. If you and I do not deal with our anger and we feed it, it, it can become an actual spirit of anger. He said, you do not know what spirit you're of. And I have seen people that actually have a spirit of anger. And it's way beyond their control just to repent now. They actually need deliverance. They need some kind of help because they have fed this anger for so many years that now it controls them. They don't control it. And so Jesus said to the disciples, John and James, that he named them the sons of thunder. <laughs> What's that about? Why would you change their names from Jane, James and John, son of Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus or whatever, to sons of thunder? Because they had an anger problem. And one of them, I don't know where both of them said, listen, Jesus, let's call fire down like Elijah did and burn them all up. Now, just for a minute, these are innocent women, babies, sons and fathers and uncles and brothers. They want to kill. I, I want you to get the magnitude of this anger. They want to kill the whole city of people just because they have hatred in their heart. And Jesus turned and said, he rebuked them. And he said, you don't know what spirit you're of. I didn't come to kill people. I came to save them. So be careful when it comes to anger that you don't feed the anger or justify it. You can't control what someone does to you, but you can control the way you respond to what they've done to you. And so people say, you make me so mad. No, you're angry. I didn't make you anything. And so we have to deal with it within ourselves. And so my answer is if, we are if we're not diligent to remove the anger, it can become an unclean spirit. Jesus said, you do not know what spirit you're of. And so we're going to turn back in the Old Testament and look at a king. We're going to go all the way back to 2 Chronicles chapter 26. We're going to look at the high price of anger. 2 Chronicles 26, and I'm going to read all the way from verse 1 to 15, because not everybody knows the story uh, of this young man named Uzziah. And so we're going to look at the high price of anger and what it cost this king tonight because he couldn't control his temper and his anger. Uh, 2 Chronicles 26, 1, all the way through 15. I'll probably make little highlights. Anyway, verse 1. <clears throat> then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the place of his father Amaziah. Now the name Uzziah, his name, the king's name, means the Lord is my strength. And his father's name means stay strong in the Lord. So both of them, Uzziah and Amaziah, were known as men that were strong in faith, strong in the Lord. And I just want to say this publicly, the last thing I want is a 16-year-old telling me what to do. Can I get an amen? Can you imagine a 16-year-old ruling? Oh, dear Jesus. So anyway, um, verse 2. I want to show you some of his accomplishments because I think he got filled with pride. And because of the pride and anger, it cost him so much. Verse 2. He built Eloth and, and restored it to Judah after, the kings, after that the king slept with his fathers. Verse 3. 16 years old was Uzziah when he became when he began to reign. Now watch this, very important. He reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. Do you understand that after 52 years, so what's 52 and 16, 6, 7, 8, what is he, 68 years old now? This guy's been reigning for 52 years. Who's going to tell him anything? Do you understand that after year after year after year after year, 50, it's very important you get this, 52 years he was the king. And he thought that he was an end-all to it all because he had ruled for 52 years. And who wouldn't if you started at 16 and now you're in your 60s, who's going to tell me what to do after I've been in leadership all these years? Verse 3, he, he reigned 52 years. His mother's name was uh, Joachiah. If I didn't say that right, I'm sorry. Oh, Jekka, Jekaliah. Her name means powerful. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Now, this is real good. This stays real good for a while. Verse 5. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding of the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, 
God made him prosper. This is wonderful news. So I, I just now looked at my notes. I guess I should pay attention to what I wrote. In verses 1 to 4, you can see it. He reigned 52 years. In verses 5 to 7, you're going to see him seek the will of God and prosper. So I'm going to read 5 again. He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding and visions. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. He went forth and he warred against the Philistines. He broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jebeth, uh, Jebeth the wall of Ashdod. He built cities in Ashdod among the Philistines. Verse 7. And God helped him. Listen to this. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians that dwelt in Garabala, and the other name, <laughs> I have it written in my Bible, uh, but I can't even read my own writing. So here's what we know. Verse 5 to 7, he sought the Lord. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Now we're going to pick it up in verse 8 to 14. We're going to see what happens next. He's going to build the greatest armies in the Old Testament. He just does incredible things. Verse 8. And the Ammonites gave gifts to Uzziah, and his name spread abroad, even to the entering in of Egypt, for he strengthened himself exceedingly. Verse 9. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, at the turning of the wall, and he fortified them. He also built towers in the desert. He digged many wells, for he had much cattle, both in the lowland and in the plains. Husbandmen also and vine dressers in the mountains in Carmel, for he loved husbandry, which is soil. He liked to plant and, and work in the garden. Verse 11. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men who went out to war by bands according to the number of their account by the hand of Jeel, the scribe, and Manasseh, the ruler, under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. Verse 12. Whew. The whole army of the chief of the fathers and the mighty men of valor were 2,600. Under their hand they had an army. Are you ready? 300,000, 7,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. So this is pretty strong. I'm going to read through 15. And Uzziah prepared for them a host of shields and spears, helmets and harp. Um, I was practicing that today. Harbor Johns or something. Bows and slings and stones. He's the first guy. Have you ever seen the catapult? Like in... Um, Robin Hood, you know how they have the moat around the castle, and then on the other side they have this big thing, they put a rock in it. He invented this. Uzziah is the first person to ever invent this in verse 15. It said, and he made engines invented of cunning men on the towers and bulwarks, that's that stone that they would throw over, to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread abroad, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. Now, you might think this is a good thing, but it's his own self-strength. It's not the strength of God. Every time he asked God, every time he went to one of the prophets, he was strengthened. This time, after 52 years, come on, and all these accomplishments, one of the greatest armies that ever lived, uh, he invented weapons of war. He was well-known all the way to Egypt, they said. Princes and kings would bring him presents. It went to his head. And so now he is strong. In the NIV version, if anybody has that tonight or online, it actually means until he got into pride. So this is very dangerous for us that we stop depending on God and start depending on ourselves. So he made a great name for himself on, until he became strong or self-sufficient is another way to say it. He felt he was self-sufficient. Now we're going to see what happens to him in verse 16. I'm going to go down each verse, verse 16. But when he was strong, his heart lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord. He went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now, I have to give you a little bit of breakdown here. He is a king. He is not a priest. Uh, for those, I don't know if everybody knows this, and I know there's people watching online, but there was a tabernacle of Moses, and it had three sections. There was an outer court, a holy place, and the holy of holies. In the outer court, and Lord help my memory, in the outer court, there was an altar of sacrifice and a laver filled with water. Everybody was welcome in the outer court. And none of us get into Jesus or into the kingdom without two things in the outer court, blood and water. How many of you know in John 19, 34, they put a spear 
in Jesus' side and blood and water came out. So the outer court of the tabernacle was for everybody because there was a sacrifice and a washing, the blood and the water. Then there was the holy place. In the holy place, they had a table with shoe bread, uh, bread with unleavened bread for the priest. They had um, a, a menorah, the candle light of the Lord, the seven spirits of God. And in front of this veil in the holy place, they had an altar of incense. Now, only the priest could go from the outer court into the holy place. And he would burn incense upon the altar. And the incense, as it went up in the fragrance of God, was prayer. I think it's Psalm 141, verse 1 and 2. said, let my prayer be as incense and the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. And so only the priest could burn incense on the altar. And then behind the veil, um, just a quick recap of the tabernacle, behind the veil was the Ark of the Covenant, and on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. And only the high priest, not any priest, not any Levite, only the high priest could go one day a year behind the curtain with blood, and they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. It was called the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, in Luke, uh, not Luke, in Leviticus 16. So when this King Uzziah decided to overstep his authority spiritually and go into the tabernacle, he had no right to go in there. He was not a priest. He was a king. And so they're going to try to warn him, but he's not going to listen. Look what happens next. So in verse 16, his heart was lifted up. It actually says that when his heart was lifted up to his destruction, he sinned against the Lord. Verse 17 and 18 we're going to see that he was warned and he refused to be corrected. That's very dangerous, guys. When you and I think we can't be corrected, uh, that's a dangerous place to be. I've been in ministry for, I'm going to say, 30 years plus, reading the Bible for 40 years plus. I still make mistakes. I still need to be corrected. And I welcome it. I don't ever want to get to the place where I think I know it all. You've got to be kidding me. Because the anointing will just lift in a moment. You, you've got to stay teachable, approachable. And you have to be able to be corrected without getting upset at the person. And uh, so in verse... I'm trying to read verse 17. And Azariah, his name means God will help us. And Azariah the priest went in after him with 80 priests, four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men. So listen, guys, get this tonight. The king has just stepped over a territory he has no business being in. He should not be in the holy place. He's not a priest. A, a, a high priest, I think he's a high priest, or one of the well-known priests, as a, uh, as a, I said it a minute ago and I was so good. The guy with the capital A, he went in and he took 80 priests with him. Now, just in your mind, can you imagine how many 80 priests is? Listen, guys, that's a lot of people. And the tabernacle wasn't that big inside. I mean, I don't know the dimensions by memory. <laughs> I have better things to do than that. But I am sure they were mass crowded, no social distancing in there. 80 priests in there saying, Uzziah, don't do this. Come out, come out. You're a king. You have no right to do this. But he wouldn't listen to him. He wouldn't take correction. Here we go. Verse 18. 80 priests, that's a lot of men of God. They withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, it, Doesn't it appear unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord? But the priest only, the son of Aaron that are consecrated to burn incense, go out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. Neither shall it be for your honor from the Lord thy God. So they gave him every opportunity known to man to repent. Listen, Uzziah, don't do this. We're all here because we love you. We want the best for you. You're, you're out of your jurisdiction. Stay in your own lane. Please, Uzziah, come out. Well, he got so angry at them. Look at verse 19. Then Uzziah was wrought. The NIV said he was angry. Uh, the New King James said he was furious. So he's really mad at them. And he had a censer in his hand to burn the incense. And while he was wrought or angry with the priest, leprosy rose up on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the altar of incense. Because Uzziah was angry, he became a leper. Now, I can't own this. My son preached this, and it was one of the best points I've heard. He said, where did God, this is worth you coming out tonight, where did God put his leprosy? Across his forehead. You know why? Everybody could see it but him. 
Oh, I thought that was so phenomenal. I just, we don't see pride. We don't see pride. We don't see arrogance. We don't see when we're unteachable. We don't see it, but other people see it. So I, I got the witness, you know what I mean? The quickening. Like, he put it on his forehead so everybody that looked at him saw it, but the king didn't see it himself. And isn't that how it is with pride? We don't see it. And then you next thing you know, we're separated from the Lord. Something isn't right. We don't know what's wrong. And so be really careful. I'm not teaching on pride tonight, but be really careful to try to stay humble before the Lord. Um, pride's a terrible thing. It's very subtle. You don't even know you have it. And, and it can separate you from God. And so we're going to talk about what the king lost in this story. Let me continue to read. I want to read through probably all the way through verse 23. I think I just read 19, right? Okay, I'm going to read 19 again because it's that good. Then Uzziah was wrought, had a censer in his hand with incense, and while he was angry with the priest, the leprosy rose up on his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. They thrust him out from there. Yea, he himself hastened also to go out, because what? The Lord had smitten him. Now listen, I'm a firm believer in healing. I know Jesus heals by his stripes, I am healed. But I also know that when I give the devil place in anger or sin or rebellion, I open myself for the door to the enemy and he will come in. And so this was not the devil that did this to him. This was God that did this to him. I don't have time and you're probably going to say, thank God. But do you know there were many people stricken by leprosy from the Lord? If you've ever read Numbers 12, Miriam was jealous of Moses' relationship with God. Miriam spoke against Moses' wife, and God smote Miriam with leprosy. There was a guy named Gehazi. He was a servant of the prophet Elisha, and he got leprosy for coveting and being jealous. I have a whole sermon on healing the leper because pride gives us leprosy. And here's the deal, guys. I just feel like talking to you for a minute tonight. Here's the deal with leprosy. It deadens your nerves. That's why a person in the Bible that had leprosy could stub their foot on a rock, maybe lose a toe and not even know they, they lost it because they had no feeling. Listen, spiritual leprosy is when we are around the people of God, supposedly in the presence of God, and we have no feeling whatsoever. I check right away. I don't want my nerves damaged. I don't want pride to make me think I'm better than I am and separate me from God. So to be a leper was really a bad thing in the Bible. And you, so he got it across his forehead. And I already made that big point. You want to go, I'll make it again. You all get excited. You ready? He put it on his forehead. You know why? So everybody could see it but him. <gasps> awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, so let's take a look now. At, I, I have it called not the Lion King, but the Leper King. You ready? Here we go. In verse 20, well, let me read through 22 because I don't think I, I think I got carried away. In verse 21, and Uzziah the king was a leper under the day of his death. He dwelt in a several separated house being a leper. He was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham, his son, was king over the, his house, judging the people. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah, first and last, did Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, write. So Uzziah slept with his fathers, and they buried him. Now, here's what he lost. Number one, he lost his throne. He lost his position. He totally lost his authority. Excuse me. Lost his position. He could no longer be king, and he could no longer sit on the throne. The next thing he lost was his health. Because leprosy spreads. It was incurable. And you've all seen and heard that in that day they all lived in a leper colony and people wouldn't even, um, is it the movie Ben-Hur or The Cloak? I can't, one of them, uh, yeah, their mother and sister had leprosy and they would come to the top of the hill and throw food down and the lepers would come out. Even in Jerusalem they would take broken vessels, pottery that was marred, and they would smash it over the wall of Jerusalem and all the lepers would come out at night and scrape the poison out of their bodies. And that's when Job said about the boils that he sat in the ashes with pot shed. It was broken pottery and they would scrape their wounds. Really very nasty. So he lost his health. Now one of the other things he lost is his future. He completely lost his future. And then if it's not bad enough in verse 21, 
He lost the privilege to go into the house of the Lord. He could not go into the temple or the tabernacle of God because he was a leper. And so that's pretty serious. And so I just did one story of one man tonight because I think we can all relate to this. We all have to be on guard for pride, anger. We have to be teachable. We have to be able to be corrected. We have to, if somebody rebukes us, thank God for it. What's the Bible say? Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend as iron sharpens iron. So tonight, let's look at a way uh, before we close in how do I diffuse, uh, how do you diffuse your anger? Now, let me just say this. In my opinion only, just me, I think anger is like a ticking time bomb. And I think it just, over the years, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you can't just dismantle it like that. It'll, it'll blow. You have to just take piece by piece by piece. Not too long ago, I think it was on regular TV, I saw the Hurt Locker, I think that's what it called, and the guy diffused bombs and had a whole gear everywhere and went in, you know, now they have uh, robots that do it for us. But I looked at that movie and I thought, boy, anger is just like that. If you try to just bring it out, like open it up, look at this, kaboom, and everybody gets hit with shrapnel. Better to just dismantle it piece by piece by piece. And so let's go again to Proverbs. We're going to be there for a moment. And uh, we're going to look at how do I diffuse my anger. And I've already made enough points about King Uzziah. God, forgive us of our pride. Please help us be teachable and correctable. God, don't ever let us think that we know it all. And Lord, don't let us get leprosy. We don't want to be out of your presence. We don't want to have our nerves deadened to you. So let's take a look at how to diffuse our anger. Proverbs 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So number one, a soft answer. And here's what I've tried. I don't do real well all the time, but I try to watch my volume. Have you ever seen somebody that's getting angry? Their volume goes up and up and up, and you're not even aware of it. I mean, your body language speaks more than our words. And so when you see somebody mad at somebody, you can read, you can feel it, you can walk in a room and you could cut it with a knife. I mean, I remember as a kid a couple times when my brother was mad at my other brother and we were having dinner and I just couldn't wait to get up from the table. It was so uncomfortable. Just, you can't really define it, but it was in the air and we all knew it. Every Nobody was talking to anybody. It was terrible, very uncomfortable. And that's how anger is. And so it, it just gets, you get louder and louder and more defensive. And here's our problem. I mean, I'm just talking to you. We're thinking of our answer instead of listening to what they're saying. You do know that. I'm not the only one that does that. When you come at me, my first response is to think of my answer. And even the Bible says the first person to speak is not, or answer a question before they hear it is not wise. Instead of doing that, try really hard to understand where they're coming from. <laughs> I got a story. Who knew this was coming up? Real quick. Um, I got time. I was in, uh, I was at a Women's Glow conference years ago, and we were all trying to save money. Oh, dear God. So we had five women in one hotel room. Five. We had two double beds, and one of us slept on the floor. And how many of you know a four-day weekend with five women in one bathroom is a disaster? It's just waiting to happen. Well, one of the women, I won't mention her name because I think we know her, but one of the women was a single girl who had a lot of money, and I guess she was probably close to 30. She was not a young kid, and she was used to getting her own way whenever she wanted it. And so she started bossing us around. Now, we're four married women, and so we know how to kind of go with the flow and submit, you know. But she was really getting on my nerves by the second and third day, and no matter where we wanted to eat, she wanted to go somewhere else. And, and boy, I was on the edge. And so one night... Um, I left the conference early because a woman needed ministry. And so we went back to our room and we're sitting on the two beds and we're praying. And the girl's crying that I'm ministering to. In walks this single woman and flips the TV on. Full volume. Do you remember this, Liz? I'll talk to you on the way home. I think you might have been there. And I, Liz didn't do it. But I said, turn that TV off. And she says this, make me. I don't know what happened to me. I stood up and she was a big girl, a lot bigger than I was. And so I looked at her and thought, I'm going to lose this fight. So I grabbed the TV and pulled the thing out of the wall. And I said, now the TV's off and I'm going to continue to pray. And so she stormed out. Now here's my problem. I have to tell the front desk that there was an accident with the tell. I pulled the wires right out of the wall. 
I really wanted to wrap around her neck, but I was afraid of her. So I lied. I mean, let's tell the truth. I went to the front desk and I said, I get up in the middle of the night to pee. I wasn't awake and I tripped over the wires and I pulled the TV out of the wall and here's my car charge card. So I'm confessing that I lied um, because anger will do that to you. And so I remember that night and I wanted a piece of her so bad. And so we fly back and we get to Philadelphia and she asked me to carry her bags. Well, I'm not going to tell you what I said to her because it's not in the good book. And uh, then her father came to get us, and we, we did not say one word from Philadelphia International to Northfield, New Jersey. We didn't, nobody spoke one word in the car the whole time. I couldn't wait to get away from her. So I don't know what got me there, but I didn't have a soft answer. <laughs> and I didn't turn away my wrath, and I busted the TV. So, okay, watch yourself. All right, Proverbs 16, verse 32. This is how we diffuse our anger. We try to keep it our volume down, we try to keep control of our emotions, we try to hear what they have to say before we blow up. Uh, Proverbs 16, 32, here's the answer. Let your spirit rule you, not your emotions. Let your spirit rule you. Verse 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that rules his spirit is better than he that takes a city. You know, I can't think of the verse in Ecclesiastes where it says, don't be angry in your spirit. It's like just foolishness. I can't find it now. But here's the answer. Let your spirit rule you because the Holy Spirit doesn't want us angry, doesn't want us in sin, doesn't want us to have vengeance and hurt people. And so let your spirit rule you. I'm going to read it again. Verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit than he that takes a city. Proverbs 19, 11. Proverbs 19, verse 11. This is what to do, guys, when we're angry. Don't deny that you get angry. Deal with it, confess it, turn from it, pray about it. Try to let the Spirit of God rule in your heart. And so in Proverbs 19, 11, it said, The discretion of a man defers his anger. It is his glory to pass over an offense. So his dis the discretion of a man, I'm sorry that I didn't look that up in other versions, but it said it is the glory of a man to overlook the offense. So what I wrote on my worksheet for Proverbs 19.11, try to overlook it. You know, unless it's something that's bothering you day and night, you know, pick your battles. Let the small things go. Um, and so we are going to try to keep a soft voice and hear the person, what they have to say. We're going to let the Holy Spirit rule us and not our emotions. And then if you can possibly overlook it, overlook it. And it'll do you the world of good. And Proverbs 29, verse 8. Proverbs 29, verse 8. Um, it says, <clears throat> uh, Scornful men bring a city into a snare, but the wise man turns away wrath. A wise man turns away from his anger. I'm going to try to run to Ecclesiastes because I know that the Lord wants me to have that verse. And, and I'm not going to leave this verse yet. Stay with me um, on Proverbs 29.8 because I want to give you the definition of the word wrath. I might have done it in the lesson earlier, but it says, um, The scornful man will bring the city into a snare, but a wise man turns away from wrath. And that means flared nostrils. <laughs> Like just, you know how a bull gets angry and runs at that red thing? That's what it's talking about. Now, before I pray, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to please help me and be patient with me. I can't even find Ecclesiastes. Um, anybody have a hint where that is? I got it. Uh, I really want to find that verse. Uh, I think it's in chapter 5. Lord, please help me find that. It talks about uh, not being, I got it. Thank you. I think that's it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe not. I probably shouldn't do this. This is very unprofessional. I'm sorry. I'm going to close with a powerful prayer. <laughs> but um, there's a scripture. I'll probably get it on the way home uh, in Ecclesiastes that talks about anger. It resides in the lap of a fool. And that you really, um, I thought I had it marked, but I can't find it. So forgive me for taking up your time with something like that. So here's what we've established tonight. Deal with your anger, watch out for pride, stay teachable, stay, you know, be able to be corrected, don't be like Uzziah, and try to implement what I taught you tonight. You know, let your, try to calm your anger, 
take a deep breath, walk away if you can, count to 10, 20, 30, 100, whatever the issue calls for. And so we're going to close in prayer. Father, I thank you tonight that you watch over your word to perform it. And God, I ask that there would be a performance of the word of God in our hearts tonight, that we would look at Uzziah and learn a valuable lesson, that Lord, only when we call out for your strength are we strong. The minute Uzziah thought he did it himself and took the credit for it and thought he was all that, he ended up sinning against you. He wouldn't listen to the priest. He ended up losing everything. And so, Lord, we ask you to help us in our anger not to sin, not to give the devil any place, not to grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. But as it says in Ephesians 4, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ has forgiven us. Lord, we thank you tonight that you're not angry with us. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. And so, Lord, we've all confessed tonight the sin of anger. God, none of us have handled every situation the right way, but we are so thankful that you forgive us of all of our sins. We are so thankful tonight for the scripture that says, if we confess our sins, you are righteous and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So Lord, we ask tonight that the minute we start to get angry, we'd pay attention to it and put some of these lessons into action. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you one and all. Um, I'm going to stand up here and look for that verse in Ecclesiastes uh, because now it's a matter of principle. How many of you know that I will read the whole book of Ecclesiastes when I get home because I want that verse that talks about anger? 7-9, oh bless you. Let's see. Ecclesiastes 7 Verse 9, that's the verse. Thank you so much. Just, um, I don't know if we're still on the air or not, but here's a verse, and it's okay, Bill, if I'm done, I'm fine. It says, be not hasty. Oh, I love this verse. Thank you. Be not hasty in your spirit to be angry. Look at this. For anger rests in the bosom of a fool. What a verse. I'll give it to you again because it's so powerful. Ecclesiastes 7 Verse 9, be not hasty in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of a fool. And so the Lord's already forgiven us. I've taught what the Lord gave me for you tonight. And so God bless you one and all, and uh, stay safe and healthy. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let me turn this off.